It didn't. There now we're live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Role Play Swan Songs recap episode. It's been thirty nine months, weeks. It's been a long time. <laughs> Years. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've done a show in a while, uh, double like back to back. So I'm pretty exhausted right now because I get up really early. So I'm basically gonna be checked out for most of this episode. But luckily, <laughs> we've got so you make like, like the usual Swan Song. Yeah. Episode. So Kinda. we're right back where we've been. <laughs> Kinda. Uh, this one's actually mentally exhausting though. Uh, anyways, this is a recap episode because we've been live for 39 months, weeks, still messing that up. And it, uh, it occurred to me that some people might've just like stopped watching the show. Cause for a while we were pretty frequent there. We were doing shows pretty much every week for like at least six months. Mm. How, uh, how many, like, wait, what am I trying to ask? How long in time from the starting episode to now has it been? Like human time, so our first human time, air, yeah, I mean, human time. Did yeah. you already track that, Adam? Or I can look. Yeah, air, I can look. Real well, quick. air date. Air date of the very first episode is the seventh of July, two thousand fourteen. Damn, dude, a year and a half. God, yeah. two yeah. years in July. Yeah, holy the time, shit, she flies. It's true. It's true. How did I stand all you guys for that long? And how did you stand <laughs> me for that long? I don't. Well, I think Amazing. the real the real question is wheat. Mm -hmm. The realest of all questions is how are Wilbur and Piani the two characters that are still there from episode one? <laughs> yeah, right? I, Without that is, I think that is one of the many questions <laughs> that will be answered tonight here on Swan Song Recap. There you go. <laughs> and now cue the quick zoom in to Adam's face because Adam's kind of running the show. Uh, the rest of us have an idea of what we're going to be talking about. We also uh, pulled you guys for questions and you guys helped out huge uh, in the sense of we have about 180 we're obviously not going to get to all of those. We probably won't even get <laughs> yeah. to 20 of those because let's we like to talk a lot. Uh, That's true. And I kind of think, we, you know, typically we would start off and just talk about what we've been up to and stuff like that. But let's just skip at this. I don't want to talk for an hour and then do a two-hour recap episode. Let's just talk about That's, Swan Song. Yeah, yeah. We'll save that for next show whenever that happens, which we'll talk about <laughs> later. Because we already discovered that uh, it might be a while, actually. 39 months from now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead and... Put Swang in the old Disney vault. And exactly. So, yeah, I, I mean, I figured we could just hang out. And, I mean, there, there are a lot of fans of Swan Song, right? There are people who watched every episode and people who checked us out on YouTube and folks who've tweeted us fan art and done all kinds of cool stuff for the, the show. But really when it comes down to it, I feel like the biggest fans of the show are us, right? Like we're, we're the ones who – we may not get a lot of time – to step back from it and kind of be like, oh, yeah, that was really cool. You know, it's usually like, all right, be your character. Play your character for four hours. Okay, now go have a nap. You know, but this is a really nice example of uh, an opportunity for us to just, like, hang out and talk about cool stuff that has happened in the show and, you know, where our characters are at and how we feel about, uh, you know, how the game has gone so far. Um, it's a thing that a lot of the time I think people who are playing role-playing games don't really think to do, but it's helpful. It's nice to, like, sit down and, you know, like, work, work through this stuff because there's lots of, I'm sure, like, unanswered questions like why did your character do that that was crazy or did anyone actually like prosper for example <laughs> answer Aww. no answer no, no. <laughs> no. also like it, i always i don't really look at too many of cuz i live and breathe these shows in the sense that i'm actually once yeah. i do a show we're like we're done with it and it's it's in my head but the wiki for this shit isn't i haven't looked at this wiki in probably it's amazing probably yeah, 6 it's months wild what like who the fuck does this? Show? I don't even know who's responsible for it. I don't even know who to thank. <laughs> like this is insane. <laughs> it's I think, fully I think, like decked out for everything. I think yeah. Zonalar does a lot with it. Um, Weasewell does a bunch on the wiki. Like that's 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 a couple of people who've done a lot for the yeah. West Marches wiki. And I think it's the same group or a similar group as the ones who do the Swan Song wiki. It's awesome. There's 222 fucking pages on this wiki. I mean, this this is the thing. Someone, and this is kind of on on the same parallel for me, where somebody mentioned to me on Twitter the other day. They were like, "So, and I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but the gist of it is the same." They were like, "So, I checked, and the entire run, every <laughs> single episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation, amounts to about 130 hours of content." Swan Song, you beat them by 10. Damn, nice. that, you guys. That's, that's, oh, like, hold on, repeat that. Repeat that. What are we? Who do we beat by 10? What? Star Trek, Star Trek the next, the, yeah, Star Trek: so Next Generation. We've officially done yes. more, more hours. Dude, I, wow. Yeah, it was more, more. Uh, I was looking at what I think, like, um, I think I was looking at the West Marches, and you know how, like, uh, in Roll Twenty, they tell you how many hours you've played of this mm -hmm. game, 
Hang on, where is it? Oh, no, this is me. I have played 929 hours on Roll20. What, do you just leave it on there, you fucking cheater? Like, we haven't played that. <laughs> it's like a steep count. <laughs> I can actually tell you how long we've played in the past 401 days, and that Whoa. is 119 hours. Yeah, so there's there's an amazing amount of content, which is the whole kind of purpose of this show, right, is the reason we're sitting here today is because if you're coming in and you're like, man, I really liked this one episode of the West Marches I happened to catch, and I watched, you know, JP's regular streams, I don't want to get into another role play, and people are going to be like, you should watch the one song, because it's awesome, and everybody's like, funny and great, and it's dramatic. And then you're like, cool, I don't presently have 119 hours to just, you know, hang out and watch it, and if you do, thank you, we love you, but, you know, it'd be cool. nice to, to ha hang out and, yeah, and talk about, you know... Uh, kind of where the show's at and how, what got us to the, the point we're at. Because I think that what develops as you play a role-playing game with the same people long enough, whether you've got the same characters or you're rotating characters through, you develop this sort of internal language, right? You refer to things without having to continually remind each other what those things are. Like when I say, yep. you know, you see an agent of the Madari Syndicate, we're all like, okay, cool, yep. I mean, I and don't someone, even know what that means, to be honest. I mean, the people who... <laughs> means they speak Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> they speak Mandarin. Yeah, right. It's that they speak pianos. I, I got to be 100% honest. Once we started doing drop frames on the same day, this show is very, very hard for me to stay 100% in. <laughs> Which I am, explains I am mentally, a lot. It explains I, but it, the thing right? is, is it works so well yep. for the character. Yep. It, so I'm just yes. like, you know, I don't feel that bad. Yeah, you got to play to your strengths, right? It's true. Like, you know, we there's a there's a, a you watch everybody actually like we Steven, Jeff, JB, everybody like people have certain characters that they like to play because of the way they want to play the game. Oh, and gosh, yeah. sometimes, yeah, like sometimes that's just like I'm gonna play a character who's a little bit addled because I can't keep this shit straight, which is totally um, like totally valid. I, yeah. So Trister a uh, uh, from your community, Adam, tweeted at me earlier today about uh, the play that I did on uh, Misclicks last night yeah. and how uh, I was just kind of, I know she, I think she, she was talking about watching Swan Song and as, as like I just got progressively crazier and crazier. Yeah. Um, I noticed that too, by the way, bro. And, and yeah. I realized that that is literally like my player brand in role-playing games true. is, is playing crazy characters who just make shit weirder for the other players. And then Until like, they die. And you everybody has to sort of lace. deal with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was making the joke after Prosper. I was like, "You're getting weird, man. I can see yep. Steven's departure already." Like, <laughs> <laughs> get weird, get dead. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, and so this this shared language of not only in fiction stuff, but and I mean, every role playing group is going to end up with these where we'd laugh and make jokes about stuff that if you hadn't if you didn't catch the original episode that it happened in, you'll never. There were so many questions on that form that were like, "What's with the stairs? Why do you keep making jokes about stairs?" Yeah, I mean, that's What's a terrible up? inside joke. What is Randied? What do you, terrible yeah, exactly. inside well, not joke? I'm saying in the sense that it's like, it's. It's terribly inside joke. It's, like it's, it's yeah. arcane yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. And and really, that's nice what safe. that's what in a lot of ways drives I think the the fan base for the show too. Like people who watch the show and who have stuck with it for a long time, they're the ones that are like the stairs. I get it because stairs and you're dead at the bottom and it's funny. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> also, so, for anyone wondered, stairs are because Prosper, not no, Prosper, no, Victor uh, Kovacs. Victor, Victor Kovacs fell downstairs. Uh, and died because I got shot in the head before falling downstairs. down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, you were the stairs didn't kill him, downstairs. but it's yeah. a it's a returning joke because someone made fan art, and I think this is where it came up. Someone made fan art of the character <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs, and then we kept bringing it up. I think Jeff was one that kept bringing it up. I was going to say it was Jeff of like because... going back into the world and like yeah. seeing Victor Kovacs there with like a rat living in its head, and then someone made a fan art of that. I think the same yes. person did. Yes. And so it just existed as like Victor's body is still there on this still fucking Still moldering planet. at the bottom of the stairs yeah. where he fell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that 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 joke in particular and and you know, let's well I want to get through the joke thing and then I want I, I'd like to just like talk about everybody's characters in the world at large kind of before we get into individual episode stuff, but that that joke in particular I found funny because it was very much an emergent property of yeah, the way that Jeff tends to poke fun at other people during the show, and the fact that Steven is so easy to make fun of during the show. That's so true. Yeah, it worked out, it's out great. Right. My personal brand. Yeah. Yeah. As and well as it. the other one is the people probably always wonder this, and I, I'm sure it was a question, but the fully semi-automatic thing. 
Yeah. Yes. Like yeah. that gets referenced a shit ton, and it's because Steven's an idiot. And that's so, <laughs> Steven and Adam had an awesome conversation. It's about so we had an it. argument about yeah whether semi-automatic and automatic were the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> There's two was... DMs, which is my favorite part about it. Cause you got oh, like... man. No, because... <laughs> we were trying to figure out if my gun could burst fire. And I was like, yes. And yeah. Adam was like, no. And then it was like, is it automatic or semi-automatic? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's semi-automatic. <laughs> right it's here. fully semi-automatic. Was that with Victor? Or was that with... Uh... That was Victor. Victor that was, was okay. fully semi-automatic. Was sniper pistol. That's yeah. right. Okay. I remember. <laughs> Yeah. So these are the kinds of things that that accrue. This is the 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 crust. These are the barnacles that form on the ship as we as we uh, <laughs> as we play the game. So if you are watching this as your introduction to Swan Song in general, um, I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about the the overarching premise of the setting. And I want to kind of just I want to reintroduce all the characters that are are current to the show because I think that we. We have a tendency to just imagine what our characters are like or what they look like and forget that, you know, tuning in week to week, it might get blurry. Like, even I even I imagine, for the most part, a lot of the time, just like a modified version of the person playing as their character, right? Like, it's it's hard to create a mental image of that stuff. So I'd, I'd love to just, like, talk about, like, what, you know, what class your character is and what do they look like and talk about their background and stuff and just kind of reintroduce ourselves to the characters. Because for me, the crew of the ship is what Swansong really is about. Right, like whoever it might be, because the crew comes and goes. But the the people that are on board the ship is what really, uh, what really kind of make the ship go. Um, so the the setting of uh, of Swan Song when we originally started talking about uh, Swan Song as a show and kind of what we wanted to do with it, um, I was uh, I was looking at using Stars Without Number because it's a that's the role playing game that we're playing. Uh, it's a, a really like easy game to do a lot of cool stuff with. So you can do a pastiche of all kinds of sci-fi. And if you've been watching the show for a long time, you know, you'll know that Swan Song picks bits and pieces from really most sci-fi uh, out there. You know, there's episodes that feel a little like aliens and there's episodes that feel like Cowboy Bebop and episodes that feel like Blade Runner, you know, and, and that's what I think has been so fun about the game is that as we move from place to place, we're getting like a little bit of Warhammer here with uh, some of Mr. Sicarian stuff. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to do some kind of like street level uh, cyberpunk stuff. And we get to kind of explore everything about sci-fi through this, this, this big open universe. And the kind of core premise in the game is that you know, it's set in the, the year 3200. Uh, humanity had, in the past, gone out into the, uh, into the universe and settled all these colonies by way of this uh, sort of technology called jump gates. And these jump gates, like in Cowboy Bebop, let you move from place to place through essentially like a constructed wormhole. Um, but then something horrible happened uh, on Earth. And uh, all of the psychics uh, in the in the setting, because psychic powers are a thing that people have developed, they all kind of combusted all at once, and it caused massive technological failure everywhere. The jump gates all fell apart, and where we're at now, after this event called the Scream, is this sector of loosely connected um, laneways. Basically, it's a very kind of like frontiersy feel. Um, you know, we may have faster than light travel, but we don't have faster than light communication. So you're still basically picking up messages and moving them from one world to another, which is why if you watch the show, sometimes, you know, someone will say, well, I want to send a message to Calliopeia. And I'm like, well, she's on the other side of the sector, so you can send it and I'll tell you when she calls you back. But there's a, a distance amount of travel there. Um, and so what ends up in this, this happening in the setting is we have all these sort of factions that have developed. Some of them are planetary governments. Some of them are science concerns. Some of them are religions. And they've built up in the sector. The sector is a loose connection of, of planets. And the swan song, the, the ship that the, uh, the show is named after, is crewed by uh, a handful of, uh, of folks who are just basically trying to, like, make it in, the, in this kind of frontiersy, uh, kind of anarchistic space. Uh, after the apocalypse of having lost all this like magnificent technology uh, in the uh, in the past, and Earth is some faraway story that people tell their kids or crazed Germans go after. Um, but for the most part, you're kind of stuck with uh, stuck with what you got. And so, a big part of the show, and something that I think is interesting that's developed over time, is that the ship itself 
is really kind of the main character. Like characters come and go, but yeah. what really matters is that they're the crew of this ship, um, which is, has created some some unique opportunities for us to watch characters come and go, and some unique tensions about like, uh oh, what if the swan song gets blown up because somebody rolled a real bad navigation roll? So it's been uh, it's been an interesting campaign in that way, just looking at it's kind of totally what, possible, by the way. Yeah, completely possible. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, it, it's been really interesting looking at kind of how it's different than you know the way that we normally have role playing games that are like really about the characters. And if a particular character leaves, then it's like, well, what are you going to do, right? And so right now, the crew of the of the Swan Song is is in a, a particular form, um, but it's you know it's changed over time. And I'm I'm certain, I'm absolutely certain that as we move through the uh, through the game, and we, we you know we do another forty weeks of shows, that we'll see that that cast rotate. We'll see the the characters leave um, and have other characters come in and join the crew. Uh, right now, there's there's two two people that have been with the the Swan Song since since way back when. Uh, her illegitimate captain, <laughs> and uh, and and the ship psychic. So, I mean, why don't we why don't we start there? Like, I I would love to just get both an idea of like talk a little bit about what your character is like now, kind of like where if you picked up on on episode forty and uh, you know and saw your character, uh, kind of where they're at, what they're thinking about, uh, why they're with the ship, but then also kind of. I would love to hear how you've seen the character, how you feel the character has changed since the um, since the first episode, right? Because you know Higgs and, and Piani have been a long time on the ship, and uh, I, I feel like I have some ideas about how they've changed. But I'd love to see how you uh, how you feel about that. We, I don't feel like either character has changed at all. I oh feel God, like we, are we you have, kidding me? I feel well, maybe maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I feel like there have been facets that have been explored that weren't there initially because I just didn't know that I knew that that character was going to be that, but I still think Higgins is the same person that he was the first time I spoke. Well, maybe it's that, maybe it's that, that each character has personality traits that have remained constant, right? Like probably, Piani's yeah, always yeah. the angry MES psychic. Uh, but you know, I, and I'll, I'll go first. I'll just kind of throw okay. this out here because definitely, you know, I guess like when Swan Song first started, you're kind of thinking, okay, space adventure, you know, uh, you're just what c c kind of character would be fun to go in and, and, and do this from. And obviously everyone knew that I would, because I, we needed obviously equal opportunity ship. So we needed a, a female on the ship. Then you always play uh, females. And I always play females. <laughs> and it just so happened that, you know, at, at that point, everyone, you know, wasn't a psychic. So I'm like, OK, perfect. This is stereotypical me. Um, and then, you know, I was like, I want to have fun because I want to sort of be that, you know, sort of angry, tough, but not really that tough, uh, uh, you know, like crewmate. And I think. It, it the early episodes are very indicative of just that. I mean, we were talking earlier about like some of the flares and, you know, I bought a bunch of thermal flares and I just, you know, tried to kind of like throw them into the mix more to add chaos than anything. But what I wouldn't have expected in the world of Swan Song and how I feel like Piani really has changed in that if you look at Piani's backstory, it really is a like, my family abandoned me, my planet abandoned me, I have absolutely fucking nothing. So, you know, fuck all that shit and my life is basically whatever I make of it, where I am and where I exist at that moment. And obviously like the crew is just people you work with. But I think what happened is with the introduction of Pi, who of course I'm sure we're going to talk plenty about, that kind of not only for me, and Adam's talked about how I was able to relate with that because I am a father and I definitely looked at it from that perspective, but how that changed for Piani is that she went from like a, I actually don't give that much, like if if Higgins or Sicarian or it, it, anyone would have died uh, Victor in like the first few episodes, it wouldn't have been that big deal to, you know, moments where like I personally was upset at some of the actions of the crewmates because it affected what Piani then envisioned as her family. And mm -hmm. Pi was kind of the catalyst for that. So Piani definitely started this as you're just three people that I have to deal with making a dollar on the ship to like, 
I feel like this these people are all I really have in this galaxy and they are my family and that's been sort of demonstrated I think through the departure of a few of our uh, of our players but then also the retention uh, attempts at some of our players so there you go so what just from like a, a purely sort of like game perspective so Piani obviously your class you're you're the psychic uh, of the uh-huh. uh, of the party um what were your training and background that you that you took for your character do you remember what those are um so back oh, way God, back way geez. back when when you like originally made your character cuz every every character in Stars Without Number has a background so like right. the, the their upbringing and then something they were trained for so like some uh okay. something like I know some of yes. these, like I remember some of the characters, but I, I don't remember all of them. Uh, I, do you remember what yours were, Piani? I think I wrote it down. Yeah, uh, my background was communications crew, which mm-hmm. of course made sense uh, because I wanted to be beneficial to the crew overall. And then my training was criminal mind because the backstory was uh, essentially because family, I didn't really have much family. It was the criminal element that allowed me to live on Madrid and then basically, or Majid, and then basically escape from Majid. Right, and then your your like psychic training was uh, was criminal mind, right, which gave you your yes your talents. Okay, cool. So, I mean, that's I guess that's the other question about, and and this comes up constantly because the first thing most people notice about Piani is the accent, right? right. <laughs> and I think we had like a long conversation about this early on. Did you start because... episode one with that accent? Some yeah. variation of it, <laughs> okay. you know, but like I'm not one who's going to fucking give up. And so maybe it wasn't the smartest idea to go into the show. But obviously it's like added character to who Piani is and, and how she is the character. Yep. So I, it's, it's, I just keep going Piani, with it. And accent. I guarantee you we have breaks and her accent changes. And it is, you know, uh, well, I, yeah. I definitely remember. I definitely remember when we started Mirror Shades. The first few episodes of both shows, kind of around the same time, we were like, they were about right, a, yeah, about two weeks apart. Yeah, hang, hang on, you can, you can do it. You can keep your <laughs> accent straight. Right. Well, and it's it's interesting too because I think that it speaks to how um, kind of multicultural the universe is. Right, is that Piani is a character from a planet predominantly populated by people of Chinese descent, but she herself isn't. And uh, the planet itself originally was uh, like of uh, like an Arabic colony world. So there's a lot of like layering of this stuff, and it's it's added some some interesting stuff. I definitely know that in character, uh, in in universe, people have been like, "Where is she from?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that like what's what's interesting too is watching how. Uh, yeah, how Piani has developed both because obviously, like the main point, like you said, was watching Piani uh, develop around the the NPC of of Pi because in a lot of ways, especially early on, Pi was pretty much me giving you like wait something to interact with that I thought would be interesting to you as a player and has you know grown beyond that. But I also think for me, what's been really fascinating is watching your relationship with Higgs particularly uh, change uh, over time. Um, and I, I don't know, I, like, I want to ask you this. So Piani gets, seems to get attached to characters that maybe she shouldn't get attached to. Like, Pi, there have definitely been episodes where I've seen Piani be like, mm, maybe I shouldn't love this robot as much as I do. Or, like, the whole thing with Mr. Sicarian when, uh, when he left the crew, um, you know, that, like, Piani was not, was very upset about that. And it's it's interesting watching uh, it's interesting watching that stuff happen. And is that yeah. something that that you had sort of anticipated for Piani when you first absolutely, started making your character? Absolutely not. And to your yeah. point, I want to talk about when Miss Carrion left the crew because um, I was just mentioning this to someone today that that was the only moment in my entire existence on this earth and role playing at any time where not only was I as a person like emotionally upset that this was happening, but that my character, it just was also emotionally upset that this was happening. And like mm-hmm. never in a million years, it doesn't matter swan song or mirror shades or any, would I ever have imagined that I would get that attached not i mean not only to like the crew but it's seriously it's like 
It was like being a fifth grader and your best friend was like moving away <laughs> for sixth grade. It that's mm -hmm. how it felt. And uh, you know, I remember that episode like it was yesterday, and I remember how pissed off I was. And you can go back oh, and yeah. watch that episode and you can see it on my face. And that to me <laughs> You were like, the most emotional about the, all of the, that, yeah. The bleed, I was, the bleed was not real. even character, totally. just the as I, a person. You know, I mean, imagine like this, it's silly because obviously it was like a Mr. Sicarian moment, but like to be the selfish crew member, imagine the moment where you're like, fuck yeah, victory. This is something that like, you know, my friend has been aspiring to do. And now because of his success, we're going to rip him away from you. And it's like. First off, for me, we didn't fucking know that was going to happen, right? Yep, like, it would have been totally surprise. different yeah, no, no one knew. if before the show is like, okay, this could be the last show for Mr. Sicarian. But that shit hit me hard, man, right in the feels, dude, right in the feels. So for me, it's like not only one of the defining moments, but to answer your question, Adam, like, no, I didn't expect any of that stuff. And, you know, um, I mean, particularly, and I just want to say one more thing about Pi. And how what I didn't expect is that, you know, Pi, which you really treated literally like a child, is that people don't understand how difficult that actually was because having grown up with that babe and been like, oh, oh, you know, like, oh, my gosh, you got to like got to hold him a certain way or, or you're going to like break him. And, you know, like it, like that cautious parent that all came back again. And yeah. it was like, if I just say one bad thing, maybe Adam does make this robot like totally kill everyone so i think that the fear of adam and the whole fear of being a parent again came back into one and you can see there's definitely apprehension <laughs> I mean, I think, at times I, I, like, I think that's every every parent fears that their child would become a super intelligent murderous entity but <laughs> <laughs> thankfully most of us don't have to worry about those kinds of things yeah so i did yeah, well, not expect it and i love it yeah and i think that's something that that has been really interesting for for me and and for viewers coming in and and watching, you know, their first episodes that they haven't seen all of this, uh, all of this stuff develop, um, you know, like Piani didn't start off being the kind of emotional center of the of the group. She was she was definitely the kind of like, like you said, like kind of the firecracker, kind of the the like chaos instigator early on. Um, right. And, uh, you know, and, and she's she's developed. There's been a lot of character change. Um, so. One character that, that I, and JP, you claim Higgs hasn't changed, but I, I have some. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't feel I, like Higgins has changed. Well, go ahead and. So let's. Well, let's. Let's talk about this. So, At so least tell the us. The dynamic just, with him did because we yeah. now know he's a part of an organization. That's See, a but, big deal. Yeah. Well, so give us, give us the, give us the rundown. Tell us about what Higgs is like today. And I want to talk a little bit about a few moments throughout the show. And I, I want to know if these are things that you kind of had in mind early on is what Higgs was like, or if they just in the moment came up and you're like, yep, no, I'm just going to do this. And, and Higgs had been clear to you well, that Well, the way. Higgs answer is that they were all planned. Of course. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's the ongoing thing. So Higgs, uh, he's, what's his, his background is, uh, his bounty background hunter and... was bounty hunter and con man, which right. he still lives up to con man. I forgot that he was ever a bounty hunter background. So mm -hmm. I guess maybe I'll work that into it. So before. next episode will be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Higgs is wearing a, wearing a jet pack. In. He, he, like, we had, I don't know where it, when did we do Apocalypse World? Because Higgs is basically, it's, it's, yeah. It, Bubba, it has Bubba. a lot to do with Bubba, which was a character that we did in Apocalypse World, which Steven GM'd, and which we played with, and Maggie was the other player. Like, so Evan for, fucking Masters. For folks, yeah. For, yeah, for folks who, who both watched Apocalypse World and, and are going to be watching Swan Song and have watched it, what's interesting is that it wouldn't be that hard for Higgs to be a literal descendant of that character, given that Earth, being so far away, has undergone like several <laughs> apocalyptic events. Yeah, maybe that's they, canon. They could, they could very easily be yeah. in the same universe. The it wouldn't egg, be that. Yes, nope. totally. Yeah. Yes. And so with it started out with that because the accent was just so fun to do for that character, and I had so mm -hmm. much fun. Not because like, well, I mean a little bit because the character was just fucking crazy. But also because like the voice is just fun to do, and it's it's easier for me to just roll into that accent on a whim, and I feel like I do it kind of truthfully to how it actually sounds living in the, in, in Texas. Sometimes it's a little bit bad when I'm real tired and start slurring, and then it turns into Zanzel sometimes. So that's even more annoying. <laughs> still Texas a little bit. Yeah, still Texas a little bit. Um, Texan Zanzel. But I think in terms of like where he started, he was a pretty like vanilla character. Up until I would say, 
the end of episode one when he shot a yeah, guy in the head. Randy. So that's okay. Up let's until right, Randy. Right. Let's that that about. might you know that might have been the turning point for me as a as a player when I was just like I'm bored. Well, fuck and it. And this happens a lot of times with yeah, characters. If you, I do a lot of things where I'm just like, this is boring. Like, I'm bored. I wanted to have some fun happen. And that was probably the, the Randy moment at the end of episode one. This is boring. We're at the end of a space fucking police chase with the vehicles shooting <laughs> so, yeah, and plasma just, cannons. Can we just talk about what happened in episode one? We went yeah. to a motel to pick up something, and we set a blanket on fire to try and create a distraction. Yeah. And then we drove away, and we got into a police chase along the freeway. So what's yeah. what's so great about doing these things? Because I, I you know, in knowing we were going into the, re the recap episode, I read through all the wiki stuff. I watched a couple of bits and pieces from early episodes. And what's so interesting is how uncertain we all are about, like, the universe. We have the, the proper nouns down, right? We're like, okay, you're on a planet. It's called Andoni. You're working for the Richardson Scientific Organization. There's some stuff happening. And now looking back at it, we have all of this additional context. We're like... Oh, like Kaliabia. She's a product, that whole arc, she's a product of episode one of you yeah. and Randy. And what's so cool is seeing that stuff in, in context now. So like like you were saying, Stephen, basically it was just a normal kind of like mission, right? Like yeah. you, y'all were, you, yeah, you were a heist. It was, you were picking something up and smuggling it off the planet. And to do so, uh, you needed to get away from the cops, which I distinctly remember Jeff giving me shit because they were too nice. <laughs> They were. They were, they were Canadian cops. <laughs> yeah. No, I yeah. like it. Like even Steven is a is a, a friendlier version of like Neil. Neil's cops and bad people are like fucking. You're you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. So it was very <laughs> shocking when Adam's like they're like, hey, you you pull over or like something bad's <laughs> pretty sure to happen here. Well, and and that's, that's, like, well, I, so I honestly think gun. I honestly think that's why I didn't really care that I killed Randy because of how lenient Adam was with right. the characters yeah. leading yeah. up to that. Well, and I think that's what's so fascinating about watching a group develop their, their play style together because I think now... You know, y'all y'all know I got fangs. I just don't use them the also, same. Yeah. That was the you first know. episode we had ever played with you ever, right? Yes. yes. That, so yeah, that's the other thing, too. Episode. For the most part, I don't think any oh, of yeah. us really knew what type of GM you were. We didn't know because mm -hmm. especially me and Jeff, who had been playing with Neil up until that point and, and a little bit of Steven. Yeah. Uh, and Neil will just, like, kill you for breathing wrong. Like, yeah. he, he is super <laughs> hardcore in that sense. I, You know, I don't think that's when I found out that Adam is a man to be feared. I brought this up on many shows before, but there is one particular moment in Swan Song where Adam had us go to a dinner in which we were fucked from the moment we walked in that door. And I was like, holy shit, man. Like, I, never again will I... What, wait, when, was, wait, when was that? Let me, let me one-up you with a story from Neil. Just, just homage to Neil and a lot of people in chat. Neil had us go to a dinner where literally we were supposed to die. Yeah. Like, we yeah. were actually supposed to die. As a Jen, group. Jen triple critted the back of a guy <laughs> to, 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 to cut off his arm and have it bleed out on the floor. Triple crit. It was the only way. He was level nine. We were level three or four. I die. I'm on the ground. I do this, like, heroic jump over a table. He, like, swats me on the ground. I'm dead. And then someone walked over and healed me, and they didn't notice, and I stood up, and I triple critted the guy in the back, and then that's how we got out. Neil was like, I'm going to be honest with you guys. That thing you did two episodes ago, you were supposed to die here. They're both, <laughs> they're, they're like three times as high of a level as you guys. It's not possible. Oh. We were like, we're like, Neil, this, what the fuck? He's like, big 20, bro. Like, yeah. you can't do that. He's like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to die. You can't, you can't disrespect a king or some shit. And we're like, what the fuck? Fuck. So that's kind of where me and Jeff were coming from. So we didn't yeah. really know what Adam was gonna like. Was he gonna be really hardcore? Was he was he gonna be? I I didn't expect, and I, I push over is not the word I want to use, but I think that's the word that yeah. Jeff was using in the episode. Yeah. Uh, Canadian is well, same thing. Yeah. yeah, Canadian. I mean, <laughs> and that's 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 a thing. So if you're if you're you know if you're gonna be tuning in to to Swan Song, I mean, you're used to watching uh, other uh, other GMs at work. Uh, I've said this a couple of times during the, the course of this show and and Mirror Shades. Um, for me, character death is like the least interesting way to make a PC feel like the universe is out to right. get them. Right. I, I want to make you. I want to make you suffer. And right. If and I we can didn't make, know if that. I can make if I can make the player suffer. That much better. I think that actually yeah. happened in episode three. We're kind of getting off what you were talking about, Higgins. But I feel like that ep that episode that occurred in episode three, where Pi came into the show, and mm -hmm. Wheat had like this really hard decision on like, do we want to bring this thing back to life? 
Yeah, do we unbreak or, or do we just AI? let this thing go off and just let it be? Yeah, which is interesting. So that that's a weird. Well, and I think yeah. I mean, I think well, let's 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 talk a little bit more about you know your characters, and then we can maybe go through some of the the important NPCs that have have made their way through right, this right, right. universe. Because I definitely yeah, we think got, that we gotta yeah, stay episode, on target. <laughs> episode three and the arc there from uh, has definitely changed the tenor of the show for sure. Um, so so with actually Kate, the tenor of the show has really been the I same. Get out, get out of here. <laughs> Damn. Wow. Damn. Wow. If anyone knows a new PC, let me know. Yeah, yeah <laughs> JP's taking applications <laughs> for, for Blazing Steven. Uh, so, uh, so Higgs, the thing is, yeah, I think that what we're getting, and and this is, and people ask me this in the Q and A constantly, like just constantly, they're like, "Is JP a super genius or a total <laughs> moron?" I don't understand the Can character plan- or me. Like. Are you just, it's like, is Higgs, yeah, and people don't know. People are like, well, a lot of people Jake think is- they're one and the same. That, right. I, I feel like, and, and I, I finish your statement and then I'll, I'll, I'll say All, that. all I was going to say was we, we see these things that happen where, like, there have definitely been times where Higgs is like, a plus on top of everything, and we're like, oh, this is like, like where you're you're conning. I feel like at, in playing Higgs the way that you do, there's this kind of um, uh, Schrodinger's con going on, where at sometimes it feels so deep that we don't even know if you know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Or there are episodes where people are like, Adam and <laughs> Adam and JP have been playing this for six months. Like, yep. it's just no way it could have been this perfect. Yep. So, and that's never I, happened before. So, <laughs> no, and that's. <laughs> I mean, I think of all of the of all the at least as far as that stuff goes, as far as the overarching kind of like concepts of the universe, uh, I think that you and I have probably had the most conversations about things that just were true from the beginning. But I think most people will point to seeing Higgs as less the sort of bumbling yokel and more the kind of mover behind the scenes was with the introduction of uh, Luminary, right? right? And with that right. sort of that side plot. So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's something that at the time we were very hush hush about, and it was a really great reveal, kind of very slowly. But um, so, where where did that come from for you? Like that idea that Higgs con goes so deep that he belongs to this kind of like Illuminati. I mean, um, I feel like that was another Randy moment where I was. There's a lot of times in pretty much any character that I play where I'm just like I'm bored. Yeah. Like I want to do some fucking cool that'll change the game a little bit, and that's kind of where that came from. That's and, and that happened. I don't know what episode around that was where I, I literally messaged you and said, Hey, what if I'm part of like this crazy fucking thing? And I, I obviously like the rest of the group doesn't know anything about it. And we haven't really revealed too much about it to this yeah, day. Think, like it's, saw, it's very topical. Yeah. I think we saw luminary, um, a bit around, like it was around episode, like in the early twenties or like yeah, late twenties or something. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we for, maybe so, maybe so. Yeah, I'm yeah trying, I'm, so oh yeah, it, it was 26, 26. Yeah, so for for folks not familiar, obviously, which was the kind of whole purpose for doing this. Um, so Luminary is an organization that uh, Higgs belongs to that we've seen bits and pieces of. There there have been meetings in which some characters are present. We've made it clear that characters we met before are part of this organization as well. Um, but there's also a bunch of yeah. holes too, still yet to fill. Um. So you were saying, JB, that was just the product of you being yeah, like... Yeah, it was, it was really just a product of, of boredom. I, I feel like up until that point, like, Higgins had a place in the ship, but it wasn't... Like, he didn't... As a character, he didn't really have motive. And then, with that in mind, like, all mm-hmm. of the things that had led up to that point had a reason. And I could mm-hmm. tie them all into that reason pretty... Like, with a nice bow. And, and some of that stuff... Has not even really been revealed yet, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, but like pretty much every action that I've taken up to that point has a reason. Even Randy has a reason. It's just never, it's never come up. Uh, yeah. And so I think that was just something that was cool that I did with the character, and, and that's kind of how I, how I play. Because up until then, like he was just kind of an asshole, and that's all he was. Well, what I thought, what I thought was interesting about, and and lots of people have asked, and people still ask me about the whole like Randy moment, like. Because you portrayed Higgs as being kind of a bumbling yokel up to that point, it was like, you know, haha, I'm not really the captain, I'm the captain, and I had to get these other people who are more legitimate than me to help me, like, do these things. And then with Randy, you were like, nah, fuck this. And yeah. and it became, like, a very serious thing, and suddenly Higgs had, like, seized control of the of the momentum of that moment. Right. 
And um, I think that's when, and it happened pretty early, but that's when the we started to see there's this two these two sides, and we're seeing more and more of that. Yeah, as and the, that's uh, that's honestly yeah. for me in terms of playing the character, that's the the most fun parts are where I can't be that bumbling idiot and I have to be serious for a second. Uh, perfect example is like any conversation with the Illuminati is fun. Anything that's like with Pi that has happened, where it's a pretty serious conversation, it's a one on one. The conversation with Prosper and, uh, or not, uh, yeah, Prosper. The conversation Prosper. that involved laser pistols. Yeah, like that, <laughs> that, that was something that yeah. prior to that episode, me and Steven had no idea was going to happen. Yep. And then we kind of just told each other, like, yeah, I guess let's just, just play this out. Like, do whatever you want. I'll do whatever I want. And both characters came out of that still alive, <laughs> which yeah. I was not expecting. Surprisingly enough. I, I think I went into that as a player uh, wanting Higgins to kill prosper that's what i expected to happen. and he yeah. rolled really yeah. really bad and that. prosper rolled really really well yeah well um, also um adam like because prosper was a warrior and like the thing that warriors get mm -hmm. to do is ignore like an important bit Jeez. of damage once <laughs> right yeah so right. like adam was kind of like okay you're passed out you wake up and higgs is over you right and you can act yeah. yeah so that was that was what saved prosper that was really fun for me too because like <laughs> Like Higgs and Prosper, like people apparently ask this question a lot in the in the in the Q and A of of like the prep for this episode of like why did Prosper leave? Right. And it felt to me as like me, Stephen, that like Higgs and Prosper had like opposing goals for what they wanted to do with the Swan Song and with Pi and like with the direction of what the ship was going to be doing, and ultimately Prosper lost, which makes yeah. sense because Higgs is the right. captain, but like. Yeah. Like Prosper didn't want to be involved in like this weird sort of uh, like, you know, space piracy kind of thing. And like Higgs with his crazy ideas about like the reality TV, TV show and everything. I um, mean, Prosper was like, well, I've had these weird crises of faith for meeting the creature that I consider to be a literal god and trying to deal with that. Um, it sounds like shit is really going badly at home as far as like how people are relating to the religion as I understand it. Um, and I'm just not getting along with the captain. So that was a really great episode because it was like a moment for almost prosper to stand up and say, no, hang on. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> enough. Yeah. What I think, what I think has been so interesting in the, in the arc of the show in general, and, and this I think speaks to sort of the way that JP, the way you play Higgs and Higgs is sort of place is that nothing ends up being static for very long, right? Like, and that's we, we talk about by, this. That's by design, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And we, we talk about this early on where the the ship is really the core of the show. And and if we yeah. lose uh, we lose Victor or we uh, we see uh, Prosper or Mr. Security leave the crew, it doesn't mean that we're not still exploring the same kind of space. We just get to see it from a different angle, which is what makes the kinds of party conflict that have come up feel like doable in, in this in this setting like no one is yeah. so integral to the continuation of the sort of reality of the show that we can't say okay well this character is diametrically opposed to someone else and we'll just have a battle of Conflict, wills and yeah. yeah and in some alternate universe prosper and higgs it didn't go that way and prosper became captain of the ship and there's a bunch of other stuff that happened there right um so i mean i think like as far as higgs goes it's it's interesting because you know what you can uh, expect, I think, from Higgs are these alternating moments of, at least in my experience playing the game, and, and I, I'd love everybody else's input on this, but Higgs tends to provide either, like, the really driving stuff that tends to be, like, about the universe at large and, like, the the kind of big plots in the, in the series. Like, there have been very serious times, like, conversations that Higgs has had with NPCs or with Pi or whatever... Um, that might not make sense if you directly compare them to the Higgs we get otherwise, which is the kind of bumbling, grenade-throwing, like, right. cowboy, right? And I, and I think that that's what's so fascinating is that you're playing this character that, depending on, because the show is sort of so cinematic in, in nature, depending on who's watching, like, depending on what viewpoint we have on Higgs, he's very different. Yeah. So, I also, you know, if... I also feel like I play him differently depending on who I'm talking to. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would think I play... Sakarian was a perfect example. Like I was always pretty serious with Sakarian for the right. most part, but if you compare it to like Piani or Victor, it was. I th I think Higgs doesn't really care about their perspective of him. 
Yeah. But Higgins really cared about Sakarian, and that was kind of the reason why. Why? Well, I Sakarian feel like, was Higgs' bodyguard, right? Yeah, and he had done things in order to mm. allow me to continue the con. Like, that it, That was kind of the, the mindset of, of how sense. I looked at that. Uh, and that's why, up until a point, I was, before he left, I was expecting him, I was going to bring him into the Illuminati. And I was going to have yeah. him as kind of like a partner in that. Um, but he went his own way, and maybe he is or maybe he isn't. I, I don't really know the, the status of that, but... Well, it's been it's been interesting seeing your relationship with Piani change since Sicarian left the crew because I feel like there was a little while where Higgs was kind of like grasping at straws because Sicarian felt to me like Higgs's backup guy, right? Like, okay, if the con goes wrong, if I get caught, he's the fail guns, safe, yeah. yeah, if people with guns come after me, well, I'll hide behind Mr. S. He'll take care of and me. And that's that's a, another example is when uh, I wanted to do the reality show. And Sakarian yeah. was totally against it. I think Jeff was also against it as a player, as he just didn't want to go down that route. And I and that was kind of like a boundary test for me, both as a player and as a character, to see like if you guys would let me change the game again in that sense, because that would have been a pretty crazy thing to pull off in like an actual game element for Adam to have, to have a TV crew follow us around or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and since you guys basically voted in game, which was really you guys voting out of game on your own thoughts on it, we just didn't go that route. Because oh, I was both. You, well, I, mean, I feel like, like if I would have gone that route, you guys would have just killed me. Well, <laughs> like that was part of what like Prosper was like entirely incapable of participating in, especially like because of his character background as basically a secret agent working for this ultra religious organization. Like he could never participate in something like that. So like even though it would have been cool and like a weird direction to take the show. We're like now we're all of a sudden like a reality TV so for, star yeah, for, crew. Yeah. For yeah. for folks again, for folks who didn't who didn't see that or, or are not familiar with what we're talking about, there was a point at which um Higgs had started recording stuff. There's a piece of equipment in the game that's like a um basically a field of like nano cameras that that record everything that happens around the person wearing them. Yeah. And the plan was to create a time delay reality TV show about the crew of the Swan Song. So we were going to get real meta and have Swan Song be about a show that was about a show. And the like, entire reason I wanted that is so we could just have a lot of money. I just wanted yeah. a lot of money in yeah. game. Well, and that and that goes back to the whole cuz and this this came up in the Q&A was like what what is sort of driving the the characters and it's debt, right? You're you're in debt yeah. a lot of money to and and in debt such that if someone were to investigate it, if you stop paying the bills, they're going to find out that Victor's dead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm the owner of yeah. the ship. Right? Victor, Victor Kovacs is still paying the bills. So That's if so that well, stops, the reasoning behind that was because I didn't want my name on the ship or something, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's because you you needed a legit businessman to yeah. to Victor put their name, and it was Victor. Yeah. We we figured that out in episode one, if I remember right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so Victor Victor is dead. There's this huge conglomerate corporation to which you owe, you know, a million plus credits. Um, you know. And the plan, yeah, the plan was to just supplement that. And right now you'll be, like, taking jobs and trying to, uh, you know, just trying to keep that debt down because you're all kind of accountable for it now. Yeah. Um, because, again, the, the whole sector runs on money. There's no, like, universal police force to protect you. If you are in trouble, you need money to save yourself from that trouble. Yep. Um, and so that's kind of the driving, that's been the driving force. Um, and yeah, and I guess the reality TV show, though that particular arc, and we'll, when we start talking about NPCs and stuff, that particular arc allowed me to play Vince Pollard, which is... I had a lot of one, fun with Vince Pollard, too. It was good one of my One of my favorite NPCs, uh, like the the producer that you were trying to, to yeah. coax, and there was <laughs> the, like the, the party. The drug-fueled producer. You said coax. Yeah. Ha, yeah. yeah. <laughs> coax. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, they don't know we're talking about cocaine, the drug that you snort. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. So, well, I mean, let's, let's, let's talk a bit about, I want to talk about, uh, Jeff about Alpharius. Cause I think Alpharius, you know, Alpharius is the most recent addition to the crew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that I'm starting to feel like, especially in the last couple of episodes, you're, you're getting a better handle on like where he's at. Um, because often what people will do when they make characters, and I think this is this is sort of what happened with Alpharius, is they'll pick like a thing. Like I have one thing or two things that I know about this character, and then we'll let the rest develop as a response to the to the universe mm -hmm. around them. So I mean, tell us tell us a little bit about Alpharius. Like what what's Alpharius kind of about, and and why did you choose to to make that character that way? 
Yeah, there's some interesting kind of reasons why is the way it is. Like first and foremost, I have a, tr a I almost a tradition, but really it's like I like to play things a certain way, as everyone knows, and a lot of my characters end up being kind of a, that guy. So Vincent Longborn, uh, Sicarian. Uh, what, why am I forgetting his name? Black. What was his name? Uh, Victorian. Victorian. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. I forget. I mean, he's cool. <laughs> he's really cool. Uh, but they all end up being kind of, you know, leader oriented, warrior class. Uh, kind of does the right thing, but ultra aggressive and violent. So it ends up kind of blurring the lines a little bit. So the Alfarius, Obviously, I wanted to shore up a little bit of the differences. Like we needed someone that's a gun in our team. Otherwise, I mean, we saw what happened when when Higgs tried to kill Prosper. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we would be in a lot of trouble if, if uh, we ever had to do some combat. So uh, there was that. Needed to be a pilot, okay. But then with a with a, some of my, my characters across these shows, I try to actually push myself to be a little bit different and, and have a character and in, in in something different. So some of my orcs that I've done have, have been, like I played a really dumb orc, and that was fun because, you know, there, there's the like, this is what I would want to do. This is what I think would push the game forward. But this is what a dumb person would do. Let's do that. And with Alpharius, um... I wanted him to have kind of a, a I wanted him to be, I, I just, I'm sure we'll talk about Sakarian, but I was just absolutely in love with everything about Sakarian, so I just really like the idea of a, a full story arc, background, something meaningful other than just, you know, here's a piece of paper and now you understand everything about him. So that's kind of where the speech thing came out, and that's where um, his whole tick, and, and that was comedic and fun, and it was also fun for me because it was challenging, but it's, it's kind of interesting because um, I've, also push the boundaries to my characters a few times into places that are not so good. Like, Victorian Black actually originally was going to be a gigantic asshole who yelled at people, uh, and that ended up being really bad, because I yell at Jen kind of a lot, and if I have a character that does that, it looks really bad. So, he immediately, that went away. Like, that was one episode, then it's like, nope, not going to do that. Yeah. And with Alpharius, he has a lot of voices, and, and, I, and it is built into his character that he is kind of remade but when he's nervous or um, flustered at all, like he isn't able to communicate very well. Um, and it was kind of interesting because like that was funny, but it was also too dominant. And I didn't want every show to be about how like, what am I going to say next? And you know, how is that going to change the dynamic? So I kind of, I've been toning it down, but I also built into his lore that like a big part of the reason why he's doing that is because he's more common and he's more in place. So I felt like it gels kind of nicely with him as a character as well. But that's just to give you guys an idea of, like, not all my characters are like, this is what they are, pushing forward, nobody can do anything about it. A lot of it is like, I want to challenge myself, I want to be different, uh, but at the same time, I don't want it to be all about me, which, you know, I, I, I can tend to, not I don't, like, intend for that to happen, but it, it, I can be a little dominant, so that's that's what happens. I will say one of my my favorite Alfarius moments was when he tried to broker the deal because let, Higgs <laughs> let him. And that's oh, honestly... God. There, in terms of like how yeah. I play Higgs, and this is how I, I've done it in a lot of the other episodes, is I'm on so many shows, and I usually take the role of like being the one that does a lot of the the captaining, kind of the the Higgs of the show. And in that yeah. particular point, I was like, this would be pretty funny if Alfarius was the one in charge of this, and then Jeff <laughs> knocked it out of the park with how fucking funny it was. And that's, I mean, this is a broader sp subject, but like that was actually made so incredible because of the double fucking ones. Like, yes. Yeah, the, the roles made that funny as shit. Seriously failed oh. with the dice. This is a God. fun game, and, and role playing is so fun, and, and it's an honor to do with you guys, which is incredible. But like, so many times the dice have just absolutely been like, and now we're in epic category, and like that's a good example. And again, I hope we talk more about it later. But like. Just the whole Sakarian duel, that was that was improbable, and that was not yeah. supposed to go the way it did at all. Yeah. But history was kind of like a legend was born because of R and fucking Jesus, man. Like it just just rolled out that way and then the story kind of followed. It even goes back further, like the pirate ship, that was a moment where Yeah. Uh, my characters, like my characters, they're me. I, I want them to live. I and that's why when JP was like, let's do it a reality show, my character, but also me was a little bit like uh no, that sounds terrible. We'll die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I it like it, it's a part of me that makes these decisions. I think that's the same for everyone. Right. Uh, but that pirate ship was a little bit of a like. All right, it's early on. This is crazy. I'm supposed to be the bodyguard guy, so let's take some huge risks. And then because of the dice, which consistently throughout that entire episode, it told exactly the story that if if someone if Adam pulled me, so I was like, all right, Jeff. 
how do you want this to go down? I'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> here's here's what I want First, to have happen. Yeah. I stab this guy, then I jump through the window, and I make the you know like all this like, Jesus, the dice did it for us. So I, to echo that point, I feel like Higgins has had every role that I would really care about go 100 percent in his favor. Yeah. yeah, he's always rolled either a twenty or a twelve plus on anything critical, except for maybe like one or two things. Yeah, yeah. For the most yeah. part, it's always been a great role. It's amazing how like different people have such different luck. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I mean, I yeah, like it's in Warhammer too. I roll really well in Warhammer, actually. Human yeah. human pattern recognition is such that we yeah we start to see patterns where maybe none exist, yes. and it shapes the mythology of the characters in play, right? Like, I mean, Mister Sicarian in episode what two or three when you when you boarded the pirate ship and killed everyone on board. Yeah, you you're not like it's not like Mr. Sakarian was that great at anything. Nope. Like he just he was just a first level warrior, right? And yeah. there were other warriors on board fighting you. You just happened to roll really well and plan for making rolls when you would have an opportunity to do well. But what's cool is that there are these things. So when people refer to like you know the cook or the chef or whatever, that's all from that. We build these legends out of these moments of randomness. Um, that was funny too, because that was all like. We were trying to maneuver to either get them to leave or something like that. Like we're we're not a threat at all, or get me in position so I could shoot them freely. That's where the whole cook thing even came from. Yeah, actually. yeah. That's yeah, nobody. Yeah. That's just the cook. Oh yeah. So Alfarius, Alfarius yeah. is a character. I just I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, his sort of place in the world because what's been interesting for me in the last couple of episodes is that. So Andoni is a big part of the campaign's background. Your first mission was there. Uh, it's where um, uh, ostensibly like Pi and the uh, the Warmind came the Warmind. from. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that now we have this character who could not have existed at the beginning of the show, right? right. Like you're we're we're building and reacting to each other as we move through the universe based on the things that we're building together. Alpharius is a survivor of the planetary destruction of Andoni, which wouldn't have happened had it not been for events that we saw on screen earlier in the campaign, which is what I really think is is cool and makes this feel like a living universe because yep. we're seeing things that matter come up out of the things that are, are different. Um, right. There are all of these points throughout the show where it could have gone in this like totally other direction and the universe would be completely yeah. different. Yep. Yeah. And, well, so what, we're going to go to break in a second, but one thing I want to share too, which I unfortunately I don't have a fault with what you just said, so it sounds kind of rude. No, it's don't okay. mind. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just I was just pointing out that yeah. that that's a thing that's possible, and it, it yeah. shows the kind of breadth of show we've got so far. For yeah, sure, that is cool. Um, one of the things I liked about kind of the evolution of the voice thing too, obviously I've been scaling it back a little bit, but like one of the places where I really was tripping up the speech, and, and I like how it functions, uh, was when we visit. That, well, when we kind of had a brush with Warmind at, you know, Speak of the Devil, and you did a great job, Adam, of, like, not necessarily, like, cramming it in, in the face of Alfarius, like, here's your nemesis, but, like, it kind of subtly appeared, and uh, he was just, he, like, lost all control of speaking, and actually, and this is, like, this is all mediums of, of entertainment for me, that I really seek, like, emotional experiences, I think that's where a lot of meaning is, so Anna's always like, why are you watching depressing and sad movies and stuff like that, it's like, well... A lot of those, yeah, it, you feel sad, but it's like it's a it's a transportation to sadness that's not your own. So it's kind of fun's a weird word, but it's like it's a it's an experience. You're you're like, oh, I feel sad for these people and for the story, and I feel emotional about this. Well, the same thing happens in role playing. That's why it's been such a fucking amazing experience over the years. And and, and Swan Song has been a huge catalyst for a lot of that. But like when I was really stuttering and having a tough time speaking, I in the back of my mind too, I'm like, you know, don't act, don't overact this because you don't want to. You don't want in any way, shape, or form to be offending people that actually do suffer from speech impediments. I, I'm very conscientious of that. But at the same time, I'm portraying a character that literally cannot physically speak because he's so distraught with what's happening. And also, he's a cyborg. Right. Um, so that was actually kind of an emotional experience for me. Like, I was getting frustrated. I was feeling sad. And I was feeling upset. And it was purely off this completely fictitious character that we've designed and made in a completely fictitious situation. So I, I was just... Oh. I was very thankful that we we do this thing and there is this meaning and that and that it can actually do that selfishly for me, but I also think for a lot of people this is a fun experience too that way too. So. 
Yeah, and I, I think that the characters that you're portraying uh, are in a lot of ways and, and become more and more as the time we spend with them, uh, they're very human feeling. Um, they, they have flaws. They act in ways that, that are, so, as, a, as a player of a game, you might consider suboptimal, but what our real goal here is to make compelling fiction. And to talk more about flawed characters with mental problems, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Steven, but let's take a break first. <laughs> Hello. All right, Hello. let's uh, let's take a break. We still got two hours left here in the recap episode. I think uh, we're going to talk to Stephen about his characters, and we'll come back and also take uh, Adam. Are we going to start diving into the questions list? Yeah, we can we can talk a little bit about some NPCs, and then we'll uh, we'll take a crack at the questions. Cool. All right, uh, we'll do just that. We'll be right back, guys. More roleplay coming up right after this. We'll see you guys in just a bit. <laughs> 